one. Hey, what's going on, guys? Welcome back to the Hungry People Podcast. It's your boy, Michael Patrick Buckley. And today we have a special guest. It's uh, Serena Farb. Uh, her Instagram channel and her YouTube channel are Born Vegan. Uh, and she is a well-known vegan activist in the community. And uh, Serena, I just want to say, like, I really respect your work. I respect everything that you do. And I know that you were just traveling um, all, all over the country. That's awesome. Uh, but yeah, you're, you're such a wonderful human. And uh, it's it's really cool to see what you do. And I'm really, really excited and happy to have you here today on the podcast. So welcome. Well, thank you so much. And thanks for inviting me uh, to have this conversation. I think it's uh, going to be an important one. And um, I uh, appreciate the opportunity to talk with you. Of course, of course. I've actually, so like I would go on YouTube and I would listen to Earthling Ed and uh, listen to Joey Carbstrong and stuff. And mm -hmm. and I've always wanted us to like sit down and talk to them, right? And just me, you know, just riddle them with questions and, and whatnot and uh, see what they had to say regarding my thoughts on this and that. And I feel like you pretty much are them to some extent. Like, <laughs> I'm honored. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I guess like I'm finally in that seat and um, I've actually spoken about it a couple of times, like through the podcast and whatnot, just like kind of how my views have changed over the, um, over the time period here, uh, since I changed how I've eat and my views on food and stuff. Uh, so finally I can sit down and, uh, we can, we can do this, but anyways, before we get started here, why don't you just tell everyone, you know, where you're from and, um, what you're all about, like what you do. So we'd love to hear it. All right. Thanks. Yeah. So I'm a full-time vegan educator, activist, content creator, all the good stuff. And I'm actually, I was born and raised vegan from conception, actually, in wow. um, in Kansas, of all places, which <laughs> I, not what a surprise. Usually, yeah, where most <laughs> people would expect someone who's been vegan from birth to be from. Right, but, right, uh, right. <laughs> yeah, so that, so I kind of come from the lens of like, integrating my personal experience growing up vegan mm -hmm. and being involved in vegan activism for a long time to now like doing that full time and traveling around speaking to classrooms and universities um, about the importance of veganism, particularly from an ethical and sustainability lens. Right. Although I also am personally passionate about the health side of things too. For sure. For sure. Which I can commend you uh, because I, because there's actually um, a buddy of mine. I may, I may mention him sometime or a few times on here. Um, his name's Nick. He's vegan at equilibrium online. I'm not sure if you, do you know Nick by yep. chance? Yep. Yep. Yeah. I, I, I honestly, I feel like Nick is actually going to listen to this. So Nick just wanted to give you a shout out, dude. Uh, but, oh my gosh. I, oh, he would even, cause he would mention to me that he would be doing like vegan activism and stuff. And He'd be like, yeah, but like a lot of people, they're not like, you know, whole food plant based. They just kind of eat whatever and stuff. So um, it's just cool to hear that, you know, you're uh, you really into your health and that you want to, you know, feel your best and that you take care of yourself. So I can definitely appreciate that. Um, I, I do have a question. What universities have you spoken at? Um, uh, a, a lot, lot? of <laughs> a, a couple of random ones. Um, yeah, not like, you know, Ivy Leagues at this point. Um. Mm -hmm but a lot of smaller like private colleges in different places around the country. Um, a lot with random names that uh, like <laughs> Johnson and Wales university, yeah. um, Grinnell college, which is actually where I went. Um, okay. private liberal arts school, right. Juniata college. Oh, okay. Um, yeah. Juniata. Just, yeah. So, um, so uh, kind of like more deep, like division three colleges, I guess you could say like smaller yeah, I mean, schools like that. It it honestly depends. It's wherever I have an in someone that's sympathetic to, oh, to the cause, um, some, uh, community colleges in Texas. Okay. Um, so it's, it's basically, it matters more about like the, either a student group or student organizer on camp on campus or mm -hmm. a professor that's sympathetic and invites me into their class. Oh, wow, that's great. Do you seem to get a lot of good feedback from those uh, talks? Definitely. I actually have like a survey form that I have students. I try to get them to fill out as anonymous. I just have a QR code at the end of my lectures that I ask them to scan and mm -hmm. fill it out if they want to give me feedback. 
And I've got like a ranking system of like from one to 10, you know, what did you think before the lecture on a scale of one to 10? How likely are you to change your diet or go vegan, um, you know, afterwards? um, But uh, stuff like that. So I I've been really surprised at uh, the positive feedback I've gotten. That's great. That's great. Uh, Yeah, I can imagine, you know being in college and hearing a talk from you, I mean, it seemed, it would probably be very influential and uh, it would honestly would have been pretty cool just to have someone come in and talk about that. Cause it's, I feel like you don't see that now. I mean, you don't see that very often. So to have that opportunity uh, would be great. And I do feel like a lot of kids in college, they just don't even, <clears throat> they just don't even know. Like they just go to the cafeteria and they just eat whatever they eat. I mean, even, even the whole world in general, they just don't even know. They just do what they do, um, which Definitely. is, which is unfortunate, but Well, Um, and I am, you know, so I actually used to teach high school before I was doing this full time. Yeah. And while, while I was teaching high school, I got to kind of create like a customized vegan workshop or class for the high school students. Oh, nice. So, and that was like a little bit of a longer thing than just like a, you know, one time come in and lecture type of thing. Right. And so I had a lot more uh, detailed feedback from them and was just you know, I'm both shocked and not at the lack of knowledge that students had prior right. to that class. <laughs> um, but then like also how open they all were and how many of them um, were like very interested in changing. Right. That's great. That's really cool. Um, by the way, guys, side note, I met Serena at the Woodstock Fruit Festival in 2022, right? I think that yep. was right. Yeah. Last year. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, I, I'm actually not going to be able to go this year, unfortunately. Um, uh, are you, are uh, you going by chance or no? I, I, that's currently the plan. <laughs> oh, nice. Heck yeah. yeah. The location yeah. looks, it looks like a great location down there. Um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I liked the rustic New York vibes, but, right. um, <laughs> you know, tropical sunny Florida in winter also sounds pretty good. Right. <laughs> <laughs> right, right, right. Um, and then, how, by the way, how'd you hear about that? Or did you just kind of like look into it and it just popped up? I'd actually known about it for like many years. Um, I just usually have had other like vegan conferences that I've gone to mm-hmm. in the summer. And for a while, it was kind of like, you know, only one expensive conference a summer or something like that. Right. Um, and it was then kind of during COVID when some of the events that I usually went to were still not happening, even like last year in, in 2022. Mm-hmm. And I was looking for something and I was like, okay, I think it's time to check out the Woodstock Fruit Festival. Right, right, right. And then you also go to another festival, well, kind of like a conference here ever in Johnstown, right? Yeah, Vegan Summerfest. That's one yeah. that I've been going to like most of my life. Right. Right, right. I got to get over there. <laughs> it's it's really, awesome. Yeah, you mentioned it to me and I was like, oh, I can't do it. But um, it's like early July, isn't it? It's always the 4th of July weekend-ish okay. usually. Okay. So guys, if you're interested in doing that, definitely check it out. And I got to actually put that on my calendar and try to get out there because it, it does sound like a, a great event and hearing a lot of great talks and whatnot. Yeah, um, it's awesome. <laughs> yeah. Cool. So let's just talk about, you know, some of the vegan activism that you do. Um, and even, even like your, uh, I guess like your daily lifestyle too. So, um, do you just like go out to different parts of the, your, your city and whatnot and just talk about veganism or, or how does yeah. that, like, how does that work <laughs> for you? <laughs> um, so I'm kind of shifting right now. Like the last year I pretty much spent doing van life full time, Mm -hmm. traveling around the country, speaking along the way. And that was not sustainable for me. So I have a house in Kansas City now and I'll be doing the same thing, but I'm trying to plan a lot more coordinated with my speaking stuff. So it's like, Mm -hmm. I'm going to do a Texas trip for two weeks and do a bunch of speaking stuff in Texas and then come back. So I kind of mix it up between like traveling and speaking um, and then, you know, focusing on writing and and some Instagram content and and kind of the other right. side of things a little bit. Um, but then at the same time, whatever city I'm in, I'm always trying to join whatever like grassroots activism events are going on. Mm-hmm. So that's things like Anonymous for the Voiceless or Cubes of Truth or um, Animal Save Movement, Climate Save, 
Um, and, uh, and then this, this past year, I also co-founded and organized uh, the first ever international vegan Earth Day March. Um, wow. <laughs> that so cool. we, that was, that was a whole new side of things as well in terms of organizing for me. And, and we ended up having um, over 50 cities in 26 different countries, all holding vegan marches for mm-hmm. the environment on wow. Earth Day. So wow. I also participate in marches, animal rights marches, climate marches. Um, but yeah, in terms of like, grassroots activism when I'm in Mm -hmm. my own city here um we organize just whatever local issues our kind of community is most focused on at the time so I've done um horse carriage protests we have a downtown in Kansas City where we still have some horse carriages and there have been some some uh I think injuries in the past from horses you know on the road with cars and Right. Um, so I we mean, protested that. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, even when you hear the, uh, what's the, what's like the race I for, uh, oh, the, derby, the, horse... the, the, the derby, there were like oh, yeah. four horses that died during it's horrible. that. Yeah. It's, it's like, yeah. And, and that, and that's the thing is that no, like no one even considers that everyone just like, just thinks it's natural and it's, it's like, oh, it's the, um, Kentucky Derby. And mm-hmm. this is just, that's how it is every year. And all this stuff, but really it's like, what's actually going on in the background, you know? And there's, I mean, there's there's probably, there's millions of dollars probably going through that doorway. Absolutely. um, To fund that stuff, to have the event and, you know, so, Mm -hmm. but then like, I I actually remember, I get a lot of ESPN notifications and I just remember like, I keep getting these notifications of these horses dying from Kentucky Derby. And I'm like, oh my gosh, that's kind of sad. So yeah. Horse racing, dog racing, zoos, circuses, Um, you know, aquariums and whales and do- like there's an endless number of ways that we use and exploit animals in society. So there's an endless yeah. number of opportunities to protest stuff. But protesting is only like one side of things. Then I also, uh, I'm personally probably most passionate about the education side of things. Okay. So as That's much good. as I love love a good protest and disruption, yeah. right. um. I prefer like when we do TV outreach, we've got two TVs here in our group in Kansas City, and we'll go to like a busy street corner on a weekend evening and yeah. play footage of, and this is kind of what Anonymous for the Voiceless and Cubes of Truth do as well, right. play footage of standard industry practices of the meat and dairy industry. Mm-hmm. Um, and and I like that because then it allows people to approach us and ask questions. So we're not right. like trying to flag people down and chase them down it's like if you're if you're curious about what we're showing or horrified by what you're seeing Mm -hmm. um that's a great conversation starter and and i i love those conversations i like having more in-depth one-on-one conversations right where you know we can really get to the heart of issues and how people feel about eating and using animals Mm -hmm. totally yeah no and i i can definitely appreciate that and uh so for me myself i've never actually done any activism events at all um mm-hmm. uh but i i do listen once again like i do listen to a lot of people online and hear talks and stuff so it it it, it does interest me and whatnot just to hear what they have to say and their arguments um so obviously you're familiar with james aspie uh yeah. so he actually released a video actually did a podcast on it it was I, I can't remember if it was like last year. It was, the, no, I think it was this year at some point. Um, but he, long story short, and it, once again, if you want to t- check it out after this or whenever, or if you even want to, but he was getting like these crazy muscle and body issues. Uh, and I, and I, and from what he's claiming, it, I, a lot of it was from uh, his vegan activism and just like kind of like arguing with people all the time and, um, and not like, taking a break and just then like in in my head i just like i couldn't imagine just like your job just being like f- i guess debating people and fighting people on these on these uh on these topics and stuff like to me that doesn't sound enticing so i can really appreciate you know that you rather educate and be like hey this is like boom 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 this is what happens uh you can you can get this for this you can get this for that like that like to me that's that's um that that sounds a much sounds much better you know than uh than doing what 
something like he was doing. I mean, I mean, he he went what? Um, he didn't talk for a year or something, which is just crazy. Like whether that's whether that's true or not. I mean, uh-huh. <laughs> whether that's true or not, know. it's like it. That's like like I couldn't like imagine the stress you're putting on your body for that. And that's what I think a lot of it is. Is just it's just like this buildup of stress and you know and just. Like, just imagine, you know, you have a boyfriend or I have a girlfriend and you're fighting with your husband and you're fighting with your wife, like, all the time. Like, it just, ah, oh, it just, it's, it's, it doesn't sound good, you know? So, um, so yeah, but so I, once again, I can just appreciate, you know, what you do with the educating and stuff. And, and I'm sure you probably get much better feedback. Um, and I've even seen a ton of videos online of people who are like really hardcore and they're like, they're like yelling at people and or like there's someone with like a chicken leg, you know, like they're eating KFC right in front of them and they're like yelling at them. And, and I do feel like sometimes it just eggs people on more and more. And I, and I question like, is that the best way to, um, I guess to, to have people change their diets. Um, mm-hmm. So I, uh, I kind of want to get into that later. Um, okay. Okay. But uh can, yeah, I, so, can I say something yeah, really quick? Though? Yeah, 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 yeah. So, so, I I mean, I will say I am a huge fan of, uh, I don't know, I call it different things, self-care, selfish activism, whatever you want to call it. Mm-hmm. Um, But I have seen, like, burnout is a very serious issue. And I've yeah. seen a lot of patterns in a lot of activists um, that I do not think are healthy and sustainable. Right. And I'm, I'm a very big fan of encouraging people to, to not only find the activism that they actually enjoy and have fun with, or that they they are most passionate about. Like I always tell people, like, if you're an artist, Mm -hmm. don't feel like the only way to do activism is go protest on the street. Like, there's some amazing vegan cartoonists and artists that like they spend their time making memes and cartoons that I, I literally know people who have gone vegan from like reading the vegan sidekick memes. Online. Oh, wow. <laughs> like literally it was a cartoon <laughs> right. that like they, that, you know, helped point out uh, inconsistencies in their morals. And they were like, well, damn, I got to switch. Right. Um, right. And so it's like, if you're an artist, if you're a musician and you write songs, it's like, I think all of that, or if you're a chef and you, you know, are helping restaurants, you know, create vegan menus. And I mean, I think all of those are different types of activism Mm -hmm. and that we need to, as an activist community, embrace those and that not everyone, like everyone going out and protesting or doing disruptions is not sustainable for everyone. Um, and, And I think finding a way that you're not like, I don't think it's healthy to be encouraging people to do a ton of like self-sacrificing, um, right. whether that's, you know, not speaking or staying up late nights. Like I've, I've talked to people who are like, oh, you know, I can't sleep. I have to finish editing this video because the animals need me and it's 5 a.m. And I'm like, holy crap. Yeah. I'm like, you should sleep another right. day <laughs> to put your video out not really going to change things. Um, right. And I, right. I understand the impetus. Like I get where it comes from and I am there with people on the mm. like, yeah, like this is not about us. This is about the animals. Right. But I also think if we actually want to change the system, we can't burn ourselves into the ground. <laughs> right. Yeah. No, a hundred percent. Or else you're, you're not going to have anyone else to, to change <laughs> the system with everyone's yeah. all burnout yeah. and they don't have the energy to do this or, yeah. Um, you're losing people or whatever. They change jobs or all that kind of stuff. So I, no, I, I, I totally, I totally get it. Um, so I, I guess like, I guess this kind of, I, I guess, I guess I, we can lead into the question that I was going to do that, that I was going to ask is, um, like really, how do we get people to change their diet, change the lifestyle, change, you know, how they view few, how they view food and whatnot, because clearly doing stuff like that isn't, I mean, so I guess what I like to do is to put myself, so obviously, you know, we want to put ourselves in the animal shoes, right? Um, but I do want to put ourselves in the, in the human side, uh, the human shoes as well. And when people are doing certain disruptions and whatnot, you know, you're going into these, um, 
to these restaurants or wherever. I know people do stuff with fur and you, you could, you could, I guess, argue or claim that these people, they're just innocent people just doing their job, you know, trying to get a paycheck. And that's just, that's how it is, you know? And, um, it, it does amaze me the amount of people that do work in the fast food industry and all this stuff. But sometimes that's just, that's just like, that's just reality. That's just how, Mm -hmm. um, this life comes about. Like some people, they, they can't just get a better job and they need, they need a paycheck. They need the money and they're, and they're doing what they're doing. So, um, so like I put myself in their shoes and I think like, man, it would suck to like have people come in here and, and disrupt and whatnot, you know? Um, but at the same time, like that could also be one of the best forms of activism to help, to help make a change and help make a push for something different. So, um, Aside from this, I also think that like if we even if we look at like factory farming and we look at um, cows being killed and pigs being killed and uh, the dairy industry and all this stuff, like how do we really get that to change? How do we? Uh, how does that stop? Because I I think and I even hear people say it where it's like to feed billions of people, the best way to do it is factory farming. And it's like horrible to say that it's, or it's horrible to even think that it's just, I mean, it's, it's true. (laughs) It's disgusting too. When you think about it, like, it's just, it's, it's horrifying and no one wants to see that. And no one wants to, uh, to watch videos and all that. Like, I don't even want to watch that kind of stuff. And it's just, it's so terrible. So uh, we, and we, and we got to think about too, where's the money going? And there's like, that's where the money goes because, you know, once again, people, they don't even question their, like what they're putting in their mouth. It's just like, all right, you know, it's, it, it is true that like you see the ads for, you know, bacon, eggs and, and ham in the morning or whatever and milk. And that's what it is. Like you don't, you don't see eat fruit on these, on these street signs over here for your breakfast. Like, <laughs> like you don't see that. Um, yeah. And so then once again, like I think about, okay, well, it's just, it's just all about money. And that's, and that's, that's, that's another horrifying side of it too. So, so for me, like the way that I see it, it's like, all right, well, we have to stop the money. We have to stop, you know, like I, I, if I'm not mistaken, you would probably know better than I would, but I'm sure like, or I think the government does subsidize these factory farms just to, you know, keep producing the animal, like, um, yeah, keep the animals coming and keep breeding them. And it's just this ongoing, endless, horrifying cycle of the killing and um, the commoditizing and the exploiting and all this kind of stuff. Right. So the, like, and I, and I've even talked to people about this in my life um, because I don't want to appeal to futility. You you, you know what that is, right? Appeal the, so like the appeal to futility fallacy, like, I don't want to, I don't want to be a part of that because um, I think like, okay, well, is one per like, I do think that I can change people, but I also think like, can I really change people? You know? So I've been eating how I've been eating for so long. And uh, um, like the people around me, like no one's changed. Like even my best friends, they're like, all right. And be like, when you coming back, you know, <laughs> like oh, wow. when are you going to eat that steak with us and, and whatnot? Um and I'm like, oh, you know, not yet, not yet. But uh, like, that's just their reality. And that's just like, that's just how they live their life. Um, and uh, you would even think that maybe some of them would uh, change as they maybe even eat, eat more fruit or eat more vegetables or whatever, just eat cleaner in general and whatnot. Um, oatmeal, I actually just had some oatmeal. <laughs> I'm not sure if any of them eat oatmeal, but <laughs> I, I love oatmeal. <laughs> Uh, so I, like, I, I do think that, and I know, um, like it might, my, my, I, I, I've, I've impacted my dad in, in a few ways and whatnot, but even still, like he does eat how he eats and whatnot. So it's just this, it's so, it's really confusing to me. And I know I've said a lot right here and I know I've asked like 7,000 questions all in one and I, I don't even know how you're going to answer this, but I don't even know what my question even is now, but it's I like, got a lot to say either way. <laughs> yeah. <God. laughs> Right. So these are just all thoughts that are going in my mind, you know, like, am I changing people? Am I even having an impact? Like if I were to do this, if I were to do that, like what's actually like, what's actually happening. Um, and guys, just as a side note, uh, the main reason why we are doing this podcast today is because I put on my story that I was considering 
um, eating eggs again. And then Serena commented. And then I was like, wow, I'm so happy you commented. I have so many thoughts. And I started to talk to say some stuff, but I, I actually had some, I had some work I had to get done. So I was not able to finish. And I was like, honestly, it's going to take forever to, to, for me to do this. So we're here today doing a podcast. Um, but yeah, cause even in my, in my personal life, I've been actually eating more plant-based fat and protein and I've just seen so many benefits from it. And simply put, I'm just eating l- legit. I'm just eating more nuts. That's pretty much what it is. <laughs> nuts are good. Nuts like, are very good. <laughs> yeah. Like I've just been eating way more nuts and eating, honestly, eating less fruit, like, <laughs> and eating, uh, once again, more nuts. And, um, and I just thought like, okay, well, if I do feel this way eating like this, then I wonder if I actually would go to a local farmer and get a legitimate you know, healthy egg, because I've seen, I actually, my buddy, he, he goes to Princeton, he goes to the Princeton Theological Seminary. And there's, there's actually a farm there where the chickens are, it's, it's actually like free range chickens. Like they have yardage and yardage of fields and stuff. They're not like, you know, pressed together and their legs are being broken and it's like nasty. And, um, he said, Hey, like, look at this egg, cracked it, cracked like an egg from a local grocery store. The difference was crazy. Like the egg that from that farm was like dark orange and like you could just tell it was like full of, you know, vitamins and minerals and whatever. And then the other egg was like bright yellow. It just kind of looked gross, you know, but that's the thing is that like that bright yellow egg is the eggs that everyone's eating. And it's just like, is that even good for you? Is that even, you know, it's just like when you think about it, it's just, it's kind of nasty, you know? So um, so yeah, so this is how we got here today to the podcast. Um, so I but, do, so I, I have a lot of thoughts. Yes. Yeah, um, so, I'm not sure uh, where you want to start with that, but. Okay. Um, well, I want to, I want to save the specific egg conversation for a minute. I want to go back to the earlier yeah, stuff you said. Yeah. Right. Um, like how do we provoke change or how does, yeah. how do we get change and all this stuff? So yeah. Yeah. So what I think you're kind of asking, and, and I think the way that we have to look at this is through the lens of social movement research, Mm -hmm. um, because that's what veganism actually is. So I do see a lot of confusion kind of conflating veganism with just being a diet, just being a health trend. And it really is a stance against oppression and exploitation of non-human animals. Right. Um, So, so I always tell people, right, like veganism is not a diet and you can be a healthy vegan. You can be a junk food vegan. You can be high carb, low fat. You can be raw food. You can eat only Oreos and potato chips. Like, like you can (laughs) just as like when you eat animals, that's not a diet per se. And you can eat all these different types of, you know, macros and and whatever. The same thing is true for veganism because all veganism means is that you don't exploit and use animals. So I do like to kind of separate those out. And then if I'm talking about just the the dietary aspect of veganism, I refer to that as a vegan diet or plant-based diet. And so, so I do like to distinguish those. And so when we're talking about changing things, I think it's also important to say like, what is our end goal? Because Mm -hmm. this isn't always like stated a lot, right? So some people that's ending factory farming from a a vegan and animal rights perspective, my goal isn't just to get people to change their diet. It isn't just to stop factory farming. It's to end all use, oppression and exploitation of animals, Mm -hmm. whether that's for food, clothing, entertainment, circuses, horse racing, you know, all these different things. Like I am against all of that. Right. And so, so I operate when I'm thinking about like, what's effective or how do I want to reach that goal? I'm clear that that is my end goal, <laughs> however mm-hmm. far out it is, you know, that that's like what I'm working towards. Mm-hmm. Um, so then we can look at like animal, animal liberation is a social movement similar to lots of other movements for justice for marginalized people Um, or different communities in the past, or ones still happening today. And so we have a lot of research on past social movements, and also looking at paradigm shifts 
-hmm. in society. Like if, if all of society believed X, Y, and Z, whether that's about, you know, um, oppression, exploiting uh, some class of individuals, or whether that's like a scientific paradigm, like, you know, um, thinking the earth is the center of the universe or the sun is the center of the universe, right? Like that's something that, that we've had widespread shifts hundreds of years ago in what, you know, the general public believes. So those are all Mm -hmm. like paradigm shifts. And we, we can analyze like, well, how did we go from this to this? How did this, this view in society, how did smoking go from being normal to, to gross and unhealthy and not socially acceptable? Um, You know, and so now it's vaping. <laughs> <laughs> true. <laughs> um, but yeah, so and so and then at the same time, we can also look at at the tobacco industry playbook, which I think is very relevant to transforming our food system and the food aspects of veganism and factory mm. farming and all of that. Um, because there's definitely a playbook there when we talk about pouring money into the system and money and power maintaining a certain paradigm. So, so I like, when I think about what is effective, I take all of this into consideration and I have done and continue to do a lot of reading and research on theories of social change Mm -hmm. and, and a lot of different people and, and movements, um, but people within the vegan movement as well have what are called like, um, a theory of change and different activist groups in the animal rights movement, different communities often have different theories of change that kind of back what they're doing and their approach to things. So you've got like the education approach and a lot of the, the anonymous for the voiceless, anonymous for the voiceless who does the TVs and cubes of truth, right. you know, has more of a theory of change of the individual model. Every individual that we, we turn vegan is boycotting and opting out of this system. Um, Then when you talk about like disruptions in a restaurant, a lot of those are kind of modeled off of a different theory of change, which is about pressure campaigns. And so Hmm. I actually think this is very important because a lot of people don't understand this. And I've had a lot of people when they see I did a disruption or was in a restaurant or something like yelling with a megaphone are like, you know, that's just making vegans look crazy. And yeah, right. and that's, that's not changing hearts and minds. That's, that's going to make people hate vegans and not convince anyone to change. Which is what's um, crazy is that was actually what's going on, you know, yet, yeah, you know, what uh, you would yes be doing. And no. And so, yeah. so, so yeah. I would argue that that that's not the goal, right? So they're operating off a different theory of change, a disruption The goal is usually like when you have a pressure campaign, Mm -hmm. the goal is not often to change the individuals like in that store or restaurant in front of you. Instead, your goal is literally to be disruptive, to disrupt their business model, make it so that people are like, oh, I don't want to go to that restaurant. There's always crazy people um, Uh, that that are there. So. So, <laughs> so it's, it's actually, <laughs> yeah, it's completely different. So the goal is not changing individuals or making individuals change their diet. It's yeah. sending a message to the corporations or, or powers to be. Um, so like fur pressure campaigns are one that has been very successful. People will disrupt a fashion brand um, that sells fur and then they'll have a single demand with their pressure campaign, which is, you know, commit to a fur-free policy, commit to phasing fur out of your fashion garments and whatever you're selling. And they will do everything. You can like target different pressure points, right? So some of that is you go into the stores and disrupt them so that you're making it unpleasant for people to shop in the stores and buy fur. Then you might disrupt an investor meeting where all the investors are gathered and you Mm. make it so that investors are like oh shoot you know every time we work with this company or we back them or the bank every time they back them we get disruptors facing us or people show up in front of the houses of our ceos yelling at us let's not do business with this company unless they adopt a fur free policy yeah right so so that's like and i think there's so much (laughs) confusion about that when it comes to disruptions because it's literally a different goal so it's like um in i was in colorado recently Recently, and I was part of disrupting um, a high-end restaurant chain that sells foie gras, which is like fatty, diseased duck liver, and it's an extremely cruel 
item where like basically ducks are force fed like five times a day until their liver becomes like fatty and diseased from overconsumption uh. of food. Um, it's a delicacy that's actually been banned in a number of states and places already, but then some places still sell it. Yeah. So that's disgusting. <laughs> like, why would anyone want to eat that? <laughs> <laughs> so there's this this restaurant chain that still sells it in a couple of states and some activists I know have started a pressure campaign where they're demanding that that restaurant stop selling foie gras because of mm -hmm. its excessive animal cruelty and eliminate it from their menu. So I was at this disruption in Colorado and there were people in the neighborhood because it was, you know, like 9 p.m., that were absolutely pissed off that we had megaphones and were, you know, making noise and yelling in their neighborhood at 9 p.m. Um, and and I would literally tell people like, oh, we're doing this because we're speaking up for the animals who are suffering way worse than whatever noise <laughs> disturbance you're bothered right. by. And we're just asking them to take foie gras off their menu. If you would help support this, call them, demand that they take it off their menu. If they do that, we'll get out of here. Like right. we want them to end this practice. So help support us do that. And I did have people who would go from pissed off and angry to like, oh, okay. Like, you know, I understand where you're coming from and, and I'll do that. Other right. people were angry no matter what, <laughs> but it was like, that was that really did not matter in that moment because mm -hmm. the angrier people are, the more, like we cleared out their whole outdoor patio. They were sitting there and it was so, ob so obnoxious to eat with us yelling in their faces yeah. about animal cruelty that like most of them left. So that sends a message to like corporate and to management like, oh, if we still keep this item on our menu and this is happening, like this isn't just in Colorado, activists in multiple states are all targeting this particular restaurant chain. So mm -hmm. they're getting this message from multiple places of like, we're, you know, they're going to keep being bothered. They're going to keep losing business. They're going to keep losing customers. They're going to keep having to worry about activists showing up and, you know, upsetting everyone as long as they continue this practice. Mm -hmm. So, so all that to say, right, you've got very different models and purposes with different types of activism. And I think that can really help people understand when you realize that the purpose is different for some of right. them. Right. Um, so that said, like my personal um, sort of theory of change that I most focus on is based off of this idea that paradigm shifts happen in society and that they are not linear. So it's not like, oh, the percentage of people believing X, Y, and Z slowly increases on this linear scale until it reaches a majority, you know, and then things change. Right. But, but social research actually shows that it only takes about 10 to 25% of the population to strongly hold an ideology or position mm -hmm. before there can be this like instantaneous or very rapid tipping point where things kind of transform overnight. Mm -hmm. So when I'm going out and educating people, I'm not trying to say, get people to eat less meat or, or slightly change their diet. My goal is to convince people that eating and using animals is wrong mm -hmm. and sort of change their mentality about whether or not it's justified to eat animals. Right. And I would rather reach 10 to 15% of the population that strongly like support animal rights than I would 80% of the population that are all eating less meat because 80% of the population eating less meat doesn't suggest that 80% of people have like actually shifted their paradigm right. about using animals. And so the, 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 the social research that I'm operating off of says like, let's work towards this tipping point where maybe we could transform things rapidly. And so there, there's um, a, an example of this that I'll have to double check my, my facts, but um, at one point I had looked at it and, you know, I see people saying like, oh, the number of animals raised and killed for food every year in factory farms continues to increase every year. Yeah. So we're failing at what we're doing. You know, we're not creating change, et cetera. And I don't believe that because that's a very different metric than where are we as a society on our beliefs towards animals. Mm -hmm. And there are some examples um, 
you know, looking back in some civil rights issues where you can see that the number of, um, you know, even things like like child slave labor or various things where you could look at the number of individuals impacted and it looked like it was continuing to increase, but there was this change where public perception changed and then something suddenly something was outlawed mm -hmm. or there was this more dramatic change. So I don't think like numbers of animals in factory farms is the, the necessary metric to look at for what is success. So I kind of gauge like, the what is the public perception how many people do i speak to that you know are understanding speciesism that are understanding animal rights and even if they're not fully changing mm -hmm. their diet and lifestyle they're agreeing with it and saying that like well if the world did suddenly change i'd fully support that right you know like they're not defending animal use which so, i think a lot of people would support that you know? yeah yeah um i mean so you, I don't know how you can't. And uh, I'm sorry to interrupt you here, but like, yeah. I've always, I've always said that, like, it's really hard to argue against veganism just for that regard. Like, just look at, look at what happens in the industries. I mean, it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's horrible. Um, yeah. And it's sad. And, and I, and I do believe that it's, it's, it's hard to argue against that. Um, So I don't know. It's just, I, if only it was like yeah. that easy, you know, you just snap your fingers in <laughs> yeah, and everything so, just turns great, yeah, I you mean, know, and the world's perfect. It is hard. It is. And change is slow. Right. But I think looking at that social change research and realizing that there are times and periods with various paradigm shifts where people had no idea it was coming. They were like, oh, this mm -hmm. is never, ever going to change. And then they were much closer to like a rapid societal change. Right. Um. So, so like that gives me a lot of hope and, and then at the same time, like, I think that is also why the why of veganism and changing your diet is so important. Mm -hmm. Like I've seen people change their diet for lots of reasons. And the only thing that like really seems to stick is when you clearly are doing it with the understanding of animals in mind mm -hmm. right. um because if you're just doing it as a dietary trend or a health fad that's much more likely to shift back right totally yeah well that's also that's actually something i want to ask you um because even for me and myself i uh so i initially started eating how i'm eating because uh for health reasons right like i watched what the health mm -hmm. and then like I'm not kidding. Like the next week I was like, I'm doing this thing. And I, and I did it and I'm still here. <laughs> and did you, did you go raw? Were you fully no. raw at one point? No. Yeah. So, so I was fully raw at one point mm -hmm. <laughs> for like a year, which. Okay. Oh my gosh. That was, uh, I don't want to, I don't like, I, I actually, I actually love talking about it, but um, that can be for a different time. But yes, yeah, so I was okay. raw for, I was raw for a year and I, and I will say like, I did some juice fasting and some fruit fasting and stuff. So, um, which like technically speaking, isn't raw veganism, but, um, but yeah. So, uh, anyways, uh, as, as time goes on here, I do think like, um, am I doing this for my health or my be or my eating this way for the animals? Because so it was for my health and then it turned into for the animals and then now that like, now I see how I'm feeling now with my body and like, I just feel so stable. Like, I just feel like, like you just can't mess with me. Like, I, I, I don't, I don't know. I don't, I don't know how, how else to say it, but like, I just feel really stable. Um, and, uh, and I think like, okay, well, if I was doing this earlier and I feel this way now, um, like, what does that mean for myself? Like, am I doing this for my health or am I doing this for the animals and whatnot? And then it comes back to uh, these thoughts in my mind where it's like, am I even doing anything? You know, because I, I just, I just live my life. Uh, like I just, I work a lot. I'm, I'm busy. I actually just started taking jujitsu classes. So going to try to like, you know, <laughs> which has been really fun. And I've uh, been really exciting. Uh, I work out three, four or five times a week. I run, 
Um, I coach baseball, I golf, you know, like there's just like a lot that I do. So it's like uh-huh. really hard for me uh, to um, set time aside to do stuff that's like quote unquote vegan, right? Like I just, I just live my life. Like I just, I, I'm just a human, you know, I just, mm-hmm. I just do what humans do. And uh, so that's like, that's where I, I question, am I doing this for the animals? Am I doing this for the health? So- and- and it's just, can it's I, just, can I, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah I, go I ahead. Have, okay. Okay. Yeah. So, um, I would say like, this is another point where there's confusion. There's, right. there's, there is activism. And then there is also like just living vegan and not, you know, going out there and, and spreading the message or telling other people. Right. And, and although like, I think we need a lot more activists and it would be great if everyone spoke up for animals at the end of the day, I see living vegan yourself it is doing something as it's the bare minimum because then you're not supporting and paying for animals to be slaughtered and killed for you right and my favorite my favorite scenario to kind of help people understand this is this is this is where veganism is not just a boycott right like as much and i hope it is like i really do hope that our you know vote with your dollar and our personal dietary habits i do believe that they are powerful in that way too and that they are you know part of what has helped the explosion of non-dairy milks in the stores and alternatives and all these different you know shifts we have seen at the grocery store but that is not the sole power of veganism the sole power is that it's us taking a stand for justice in our own life and saying, I'm not going to pay for someone out of sight, out of mind to harm and kill animals on my behalf. Mm-hmm. And and so so the example I like to give, right, is that, um, you know, imagine a time and place where stonings are socially and legally acceptable, right? And so a stoning, you know, like this was a legitimate thing that 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 still, you know, does occasionally happen today, but happened a lot in biblical times and elsewhere, right. where you'd have like a woman who was accused of adultery, basically sentenced to death by stoning. And you'd have a thousand hurt. people gather around and they'd each throw a stone, you know, at her and let her basically like slowly painfully die that way i'd rather just get shot in the head i mean it's it's horrible (laughs) like it it must be one of the most horrible ways to die yeah um so but like at one point that was common legal and socially acceptable and everybody went along with it so i like to say like imagine if you with your morals ethics knowledge right now today were like instantly magically transported to some place where mm-hmm. stonings were condoned by the rest of society and and everything. And you see a woman in front of you that's about to be stoned to death. And there's like a thousand people around you and everyone is picking up a stone and going to throw it. And you have a choice. Do I join in? Do I throw a stone too or not? Right? right. And so yeah. let's say, you know, you're like, well, no, this is a horrible. I'm not going to participate. But you could look at it and say, well, your personal choice to throw a stone or not will likely make absolutely not one bit of difference to the pain and suffering and terror right. that that person is experiencing. Does that make it okay to join in and be like, my choice doesn't make a difference? No. Like, I think most of us recognize like, oh, that's morally wrong. I'm not going to participate in that, even if everyone else around me is doing it, even if my choice doesn't make a difference and then Mm -hmm. the power of that right is like maybe you won't create an impact visible in that particular incidence but maybe there were people around you that were watching and were like how come he didn't throw a stone and the next time around there's another stoning in your community and some people are like hey why didn't you do that and you explain your reasoning and they're like hey i'm not going to either and then maybe three of you don't participate in the next one right? right still the woman is still going to suffer and die. Probably you're not making any physically measurable impact on her mm-hmm. experience. Right. But, you know, we can see how there could be this ripple effect where eventually several times, several years down the road, enough people's minds have changed and they personally have said, I'm not going to stand for this. I'm not going to participate. And we can see how that would create change in the future. Right. But even if it doesn't, right, it comes back to that like, what do I stand for? So I would say like, 
you are making a difference in that, you know, you're one of the people saying, I'm not going to pay for this to happen to innocent mm -hmm. animals. Right. It's a really, really great analogy there. Um, yeah, I, I would definitely would not want to be throwing stones at people, <laughs> but good. Um, but no, it's that that's, I mean, it, you're right. It fits perfectly with, um, how it is in society nowadays for sure. Um, so I just want to say like, you've, you've given some really great thoughts and I really appreciate all your points as well. Um, before I go on to the next question. So, um, where do you come down on, uh, the business and the people inside of the business that are actually killing the animal. So mm -hmm. people are like, okay. And it, you, I mean, you may have said it yourself. I'm not, I'm not sure. Um, I have no clue, but if I were to eat a hamburger, you know, people would be like, Oh, like you're killing that ham. Like you're killing the cow that's on your plate. And I'm like, well, I'm not killing it. Someone else is killing it for me. And mm -hmm. it's coming to me. So I, I think it comes back to my point earlier where people, they just don't even question anything and they just, they just do it. It's like, okay, what's for dinner tonight? All right, we're going to get hot dogs. We're going to get cheeseburgers. tonight. We're going to have cheeseburgers tonight. We're going to have a, you know, we're doing, we're having chicken tonight. And uh, it was disgusting because I was at a parking one day and it's like, there's just wings and there's hot dogs galore and all this stuff. Right. And I, I'm I'm not kidding. I'm sitting in the stands and I'm thinking like, wow, I wonder like really what it what it took to, you know, feed everyone in this park today. Like how many animals? And I'm just thinking of like all the animals being like just clobbered together on the field and like walking together and just I don't know. It was just like it was just disgusting when I was thinking about it. And I like I like turned back into the baseball game. Um so uh I like, is it, is it the consumer that's at fault for making their decisions to eat meat? Or is it really the people who are actually in the business working for these industries, working for these conglomerate companies, and they're actually doing the killings themselves, right? So they're the ones that are in there twisting the chicken's head off, putting the bullet in the cow, however, it, whatever it takes, putting the, putting the pig in the gas chamber, whatever, like the, the disgusting stuff. Um, like, do you think they play more of a responsibility than the consumer? Or do you think it is like, no, it's the consumer because they're still putting their dollar out there. They're still the ones that are spending the money. Like it just keeps coming in. And, and that's the thing is that like, if that, if those animal products are going to be there, that's, that's, that's always going to be happening. Like people are going to keep buying it. Like no one wants to eat a carrot. Like let's be, you know, say like, which I love carrots. I, so, uh, <laughs> I actually, I eat raw carrots all the time and I think they're great for your health and good for your digestive system and good for your bowels and stuff. Um, side note, I've actually, my bowel movements have been better now than they have been when I was like a high carb, like eating like high carb. It's crazy. It's whatever. Um, <laughs> But, uh, anyways, and, and I actually feel like the carrot does help with that, but anyways, so yeah, like, do, do, do you kind of get what I'm saying here? So it's like, I do. Yeah. Like in, even from like an ethical and moral standpoint, um, like I feel like a lot of people don't, uh, they don't question that they just, once again, they just go to the store and they just pay what they pay for. And, uh, I I'm definitely wondering your thoughts on, you know, I feel like a lot of it comes down to the, the, the once again, the dollar and the people that are getting paid to do the slaughtering, to do the head chopping, to do the bullet, the trigger pulling, you know? Um, and so, but where is that money coming from? Yeah. From, I guess from the consumer then. So, <laughs> but I guess it's like this, it's like this never ending cycle, you know? So, uh, well, I just don't, well, first of all, I just don't know how people do that in general. Like that's just, Oh yeah. Like, <laughs> um, that's yeah. just really like, it's just really gross, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, I, uh, it's, and I actually, yeah. AJ would even say that he, I'm not sure if he met somebody or whatnot, or if he knows somebody that like works in a chicken factory, but he's like, he's like, no one in there eats chicken. Like if you work in that industry, like if you work there, you don't like, you're not eating chickens cause you're seeing what's, what's going on yet you know, everyone goes to the grocery store and buys the chicken and mm -hmm. eats that. Yeah. Right. So 
I don't know. I just think that I, I do think that both parties play a role, but only the consumer seems to be getting the grunt of it when really it's like, it's the people in the industry who's actually doing it, you know? And I just oh, don't, yeah. like, I just don't know if that's getting questioned by anybody. Like I've even listened to interviews and from earthling ed and Joey Carbstrong and all those kind of guys and lifting vegan logic and, and whatnot. He's, he's, he's a cool dude too. Um, uh -huh. I like his videos and stuff. And, uh, I just, I, I don't know. I've never heard that question come up one time, you know, about the people that are actually in there who's, who's doing that. So, um, yeah, so no, it's, it's a good question. And, and, um, I think there's some complex parts to it, but the first thing I'd say in terms of, you know, consumer culpability and, and why so many people I think do focus on consumers is like, think about how murder is treated in our society. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter in our legal system, whether I am the one to go out and murder someone or whether I pay a hitman to go murder someone for me. Yeah. Right. If you pay someone to go murder someone, our legal system views that as as morally the culpable. Same. Yeah. Yeah. So I think, you know, that's where a lot of this comes from. Right. Just because we're paying someone else to do it, which is what we're doing when we buy, you know, animal flesh and meat at the grocery store um, doesn't mean that we're not culpable. Um, right. I, I think from a moral perspective mm -hmm. and then. But on the other side of it, I think it's also important to distinguish. It's not just like us versus the people killing animals. It's uh, it's the consumer, it's the factory workers, and then it's also the factory owners and the corporations, right? So there's like several facets here. Yeah. And um, a lot of times the people actually working in, you know, factory farms or chicken plants and things like that are undocumented, um, you know, immigrants and people like a lot of Americans in particular don't want those jobs. Like if you have another option to work a different job, most people are going to, to do something else. They're some of the yeah. most dangerous, like, like the speeds on these kill lines and, and things where animals are, you know, just having their throat slit so quickly, like people get fingers and limbs cut off and like like there's a uh they're very dangerous jobs they're very gross disgusting um you know there were there were reports of um child labor in mm -hmm. some slaughterhouses in the last uh. year i think where you had kids under like 16 or like 16 year olds that an investigation you know revealed were working in some of these plants um so there's a lot of you know, gross, immoral, and also often illegal practices with the people actually doing these kill jobs. So, mm -hmm. you know, I, I think like, obviously they are still participating in something and that does not excuse, you know, and I'm not trying to excuse what people working in factory farms are doing because in this situation, they are the oppressor, these innocent animals are losing their lives because of what they're doing. And right. at the same time, this is part of why I do focus on consumers who I feel like are paying for this system and paying for it to happen, pay, paying for undocumented, you know, laborers and, and child, you know, uh, laborers to be in some of the worst jobs that I believe should not exist. Right. Um, so then we have, of course, the other party, which is the the factory owners, the corporations, yeah. the CEOs, those that are the ones that are truly profiting off of this, like the people working in a slaughterhouse are not the ones profiting off of this system. They're also being harmed by it. And also, you know, often just trying to get by and this is, you know, the best right. that they, they can. So, right. um, so, you know, it's a there, sick there's... world we live in. It's sick. <laughs> it is. It, it really is. Um, and and so, yes, that we can talk about then the corporations, but I and, and there are people that are talking about this. There are lots of activists and groups, particularly those focused on pressure campaigns and disruptions. Those um, I, I have friends that are working on lobbying at the federal level to cut government subsidies that are bailing out um these industries and 
you know, artificially lowering the price so that we can, you know, Americans can keep having cheap meat and dairy. Um, my computer is, uh, <laughs> needs to be plugged in. Um, these computers die fast. I'll tell you that. Yeah. Like <laughs> okay. all good. Um, I mean, mine goes quick, but, <laughs> but, um, but yeah, so, so there's a lot of people working on that systemic side of things. And I mm -hmm. subsidies are extremely important, right? So like for those maybe people listening who don't know what the subsidies are, we have the farm bill in the United States that gets renewed like every five years. And it's, it's in the process of being renewed and negotiated right now. And it determines for the next five years where federal dollars go to, um, you know, basically bailing out industries, uh, food industries that are failing to tax subsidies, to tax write-offs, like all these types of things. And the dairy industry is one of the biggest, um, uh, they, they receive some of the largest amounts of bailouts and subsidies in the entire agricultural industry. So based on consumer demand, the dairy industry has been failing. People mm -hmm. are shifting to non-dairy milks. They're not buying as much dairy. And rather than the industry being forced to respond to this in a normal supply and demand situation where they'd go, oh, we have excess product, people aren't buying it, we better start producing less, the government is coming in and literally buying the excess milk and cheese. Like the, our government has warehouses of cheese that they are buying off the dairy industry to keep the industry artificially afloat when it is not no longer a profitable industry in 2023. Mm -hmm. Right. So like, it's crazy. yeah, <laughs> it, it's, it's ridiculous. And that needs to end, right? Like if we like are, and those are our tax dollars, right? So not only are consumers paying for this stuff, but then the government's taking our tax dollars and giving it to these industries as well. Right. So there are people talking about this. There are activists, there are groups, there are organizations that are working very hard at lobbying in Congress with lawmakers, with policies, with protests to stop that flow of money from our tax dollars and, and the federal government to these industries. Um, and so, so yeah, like people are fighting this on all fronts and I think that's where I'd say to someone, like, if you don't feel like, you know, individual change is happening um, or or that that's very effective, like, please go join those groups, go help try and change the system, um, try and stop the flow. Uh, and that that is also due to very powerful lobbying. I mentioned the tobacco industry playbook before, like, it's no accident that our government is taking our tax dollars and giving them to these industries. That was very intentionally created by the lobbying of these billion dollar corporations mm -hmm. um, and, and the meat and dairy industry, the food industry, like, and a lot of that is based on propaganda, right? So then when we talk about consumers that don't think twice about eating it, like, that this industry has also followed this playbook in terms of convincing people that we need, you know, animal flesh and secretions to live happy and healthy lives, that we need animal protein to build muscle or, mm -hmm. you know, survive, that like drinking the breast milk of another species is normal and healthy for adults to do. Like, um, it's crazy. And, and this this propaganda and brainwashing of society goes so deep it's not just the average consumer it's also our institutions our universities our medical schools the information that doctors are learning and telling people um the the information that kids are learning in health class mm -hmm. um you know the beef checkoff program and got milk campaigns and these things that the industry again is literally paying for to get this information in front of people. The billboards, when you drive down the street and you see, you know, billboards for fast food, it's the industry, like the consumers, some of it is consumer choice, right? People just growing up on these foods and liking them, enjoying them and wanting to keep eating them. Right. And also it's kind of, it is this complicated thing where the influence is going both ways. It's not purely, you know, rational free will and choice that people mm. are wanting to eat animal products. The industry is helping to create that demand through what they're doing. Mm -hmm. um, 
So yeah, so so all sides are culpable, but one of the reasons, again, that I focus on the individual side of things and that I think regardless of what else you do, like even if you don't go out and do activism, even if you aren't changing anyone in your family, the reason that I think it is so powerful and that I hope you stay vegan and don't you know, go back to eating eggs or other animal products <laughs> is because um, you know, at the end of the day, that's the only thing we truly each have control over. Mm -hmm. So if we're going to sit here and be like, oh, the CEO of this corporation is doing horrible things and they're profiting off of this, you know, they should change, they should stop, you know, sacrificing ethics and sustainability in our future and world for money. Well, like if we personally aren't willing to give up eating burgers and fast food and the conveniences and traditions we're used to for something we stand for, how ridiculous and selfish is it to think that we can point the finger and tell someone else they should change what they're doing, you know, right. because, because at the end of the day, although obviously, you know, I think some of the people running these corporations, they really don't care. And they are really terrible, horrible people. Um, but also, I think some of them are normal humans, and we all have the capacity to make the decisions that they're making, mm -hmm. where it's like money and profit and my personal happiness over ethics or, you know, mm -hmm. and so like, that's the same decision that individuals are making when we say, I want to fit in, I want to keep eating these, you know, foods that taste good, I want to be like my family, I want to go out to eat and have fun. It's the same kind of logic where we're prioritizing something else at the expense of you know innocent beings that are dying right so <laughs> did i answer your question <laughs> no yeah that was uh yeah i i get it i totally get it and um once again i can just appreciate your your viewpoint and your facts and your perspective there um like it, it's almost kind of like i'm just speechless for a lot of what goes on out there, you know, and uh, a lot of it's just, it's just, it's, it's hard to say, you know, it's really, it's really just, it's hard to say. Um, but anyway, so, okay. So I actually, this is um, actually, let me ask this question first. Okay. Um, so this is a, this would be Nick would appreciate this question. So Nick, if you're listening, you would like this question. So what are your thoughts on anti-natalism? <laughs> or no do you want oh, not god to, do you not want to get into that nah well, that's too off topic like okay <laughs> um because honestly like when you think about it in regards to you know animals and whatnot it kind of makes sense but um yeah anyways <laughs> that's just okay sorry nick we're not doing that, <laughs> not nick, doing that nick question. knows my views on this well you know oh uh, okay 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 um, because I mean, I, I, well, myself, like I, I want to have kids. I want to have family, you know? Um, but I'm not antinatalist. I'll just, I'll throw that one out there. <laughs> okay. Okay. Gotcha. Gotcha. Um, cool. Yeah. Um, <laughs> great. So then actually let's just, I kind of want to work into, um, talking about ethics and morals and whatnot. Um, because, and, and I know I've been like repeating myself when I say this, but I just don't think a lot of people necessarily care or they even question or they even think that, Oh my gosh, I'm, it's not ethical for me to go pay for this or go pay for that. So, um, a lot of times I, well, not a lot of times, but even recently I've been questioning myself and I've been questioning other people, especially from the post that I made on Instagram. And I got a lot, I got a lot of responses from that and people were talking to me about this and it's just, it's, 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 it's just good to talk over and whatnot. So, um, I get, cause and I, and I, and I know we can sit here and we can just ask all these what ifs, right? Well, what if this, yeah. well, what if that, well, in, that's kind of, that's kind of BS, you know? So I guess where we can really stand or like where we can really get to is like, you have these products, like these, these mock meats, these vegan cheeses, you know, um, whatever the vegan egg is all that stuff. Right. And I've eaten that before and I'll still eat it and I'll still support, you know, that, you know, that side of veganism and whatnot. Uh, and then I think of eating the actual, like if you're eating actual meat or if you're eating, 
um, like actual cheese or, you know, if you're eating eggs and, uh, I think like, okay, even this industry, like even the vegan side of it, like the mock meats and the cheeses and stuff, like I personally believe that that's the, that they're doing the same thing. Like they're there and they are, uh, obviously they're providing, like, you can say they're filling a void, you know, the void of eating the animal secretions. Um, mm-hmm. But also, too, they're there for a profit as well. And I, I'm I'm sure you've obviously heard of, oh, the Bill Gates. Like, I don't want to support oh, yeah. Bill Gates. And yeah, I mean, I'm sure you heard that, which is that true? Who knows? I don't, yeah, whatever. Um, Like, look at this guy. He's eating Impossible Burgers, which I actually, I can't even lie. I love Impossible Burgers. <laughs> like, I made a whole <laughs> video about how I, I don't like Bill Gates, but oh. my topic. <laughs> he's um, not a hero that vegans should be worshiping the way a lot of them yeah, do right 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 so we have this side of it to where you know you have these vegan void filling products we could argue for the animal products and then you have the actual animal products and i do think like and i question that and i and I also want to get your thoughts on this too um that it would be like if i would go to a farmer who act like I know it may be hard for me to say, but like someone who actually does care for their animals and um, they do treat them well and they give them a good life. Cause I think you will hear that from a lot of local farmers versus, you know, just these conglomerate companies. And um, I'm sure you've been to some farms where they do treat their animals, you know, uh, reasonably well compared to what's out there. But I think you can maybe, uh, take the argument that it's more vegan which I, I'm, I'm not even sure how this could be true or not but it'd be like more vegan to eat the cheese from that farm than to like buy the vegan cheeses and mock meats in the store um now is that so, true yeah it's like it's like it's so hypocritical to say that it's contradictory like that doesn't make any sense you know but like it's i, I don't know you know because and it's like, do we look at it from a health perspective? Do we look at it from an animal rights perspective? Like, how do we really view that? How do we view that? Because people, they, they like, they want to be human. They want to eat what humans eat. They want to do human shit, even though human shit sucks sometimes. And it's horrible for society. But um, but we're here for, you know, we have one life. We want to enjoy it. You know, all of our friends are going to get pizza. Well, I want to get pizza too. Oh, well, you know, I go to that pizza place and there's nothing I can eat there. So I guess like you can... I I usually I mean you can get no you can just get a pizza with um sauce and vegetables on it I guess, um, but even still like a lot of um places they'll have cheeses in their sauce, and it's just like holy shit like you can't just leave out like that and and that's another thing is that you can make so much stuff vegan which is which is which is awesome you know but it, no one does that and it's just it sucks um yeah. Anyways, back to this point yeah. here. So, um, I, I guess I didn't really ask about, about the ethics yet. Um, but aside from that, you know, what are your thoughts on, on the, on, on like a situation like that, you know, where, uh, yeah. you buy an animal product from, you know, a farm versus, you know, just walking into whole foods and supporting those kind of, um, companies, because I think you could, could, could you can argue that those companies, are also supporting animal exploitation. Like I know a lot of the big conglomerates, they even have their plant-based and vegan products just because it's like, okay, well, people are buying this stuff. Uh, it's going to get, it's going to go. We, 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 we uh, want to get into this niche. Let's change up a little bit. Let's offer a new product. Let's offer a plant-based meat. Let's offer a plant-based, you know, whatever. Uh, so yeah. yeah what yeah. are your thoughts okay. on what are your thoughts so, on that? <laughs> yeah, that that that's I think this is the real uh the heart of the conversation here. Yeah, um, I'd say so. <laughs> so so um yeah, I have I have a lot to say. Um, <laughs> first of all, um yeah, I think it is really important to distinguish here between ethics and then like the health side of things. Yeah. Um, which is why, although I do also care about health, like ethics comes first for me. So Mm -hmm. I would strongly push back against the idea that it is ever more ethical to buy 
anything from an animal, even if it's, you know, local, humane, whatever you want to call it, whole mm-hmm. foods, um, versus like some processed plant-based food. Right. Um, because from a pure ethics perspective, like one is literally taking the life of innocent animals completely unnecessarily. And mm-hmm. one is taking a bunch of plants, maybe with some oils and whatever else additives or preservatives you want to put in. So like what, from a health perspective, you can, you know, argue whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, but that's why I say that veganism is not a diet. Like you do not have to eat those products to be vegan. Yeah, there right. are people that have been vegan for thousands of years eating whole foods, plants, variety, you know, like these are pretty new products um, in the scheme of things and they are not a requirement to go vegan. So if you mm-hmm. are someone who's like, that's a bunch of processed crap and, or I don't want to support these big corporations and Bill Gates, like go eat, you know, local plant foods, go eat, you know, like, like it's not this either or. And so I do often right. see those pitted against each other. It's like the worst of plant-based products and yeah, the right. best of animal-based <laughs> farming. And so, so there's, right. there's another option too, which is a, a veganic agriculture system, which is combining mm. the ethics of veganism with the health and sustainability of the organic and regenerative, you know, gardening system. Mm -hmm. Right. So it's not it doesn't have to be, you know, corporate shipped in processed plant foods and local sustainable animal foods. It can be local, sustainable, organic plant foods. And and a lot of people don't know about that. And so personally, I'm a big advocate of a veganic food system, of permaculture, Mm -hmm. of veganic farming. And it's a growing movement and network of people that are trying to you know, transform our food system. So, and I think those are kind of separate issues, right? So we can talk about, you know, our food system and pesticides and all the, and and corporate control of our food supply. Something that, that I don't hear a lot of vegans talk about that I'm also passionate about. Like I don't want to promote Burger King and Tyson, um, you know, like- Yeah, it's pretty much kind of what I was, uh, Tyson was like what I was yeah. kind of going at there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so like I, you know, I don't, for example, go out of my way to tell people to eat Impossible Whoppers at Burger King. I am glad they exist. And if someone is going to go to Burger King, yeah. I would rather them eat an Impossible Burger right. than, you know, uh, a, a dead cow. But I don't go out of my way to promote it. I tell people, go support your local vegan restaurant. Go support the the vegan brands, you know, like these. The And, and it's hard because you know, more and more of the vegan companies get bought out, more and more of them are owned. But that's not a vegan issue. That is a food system issue. Yeah. And you can find that on the flip side of things with like Whole Foods. Whole Foods is not like their five-step gap animal welfare rating program that people think means they're getting the best of the best, you know, non-factory farm stuff there. It's utter bullshit. Oh, yeah. Yeah, like it is marketing. greenwashing. It is humane washing. Those companies are all often owned by Tyson and big conglomerates. Like whether yeah. it's plants or animals, you know, that's a food system issue. So mm-hmm. I will go out there and say like, I want to change the food system too. But from a purely ethics perspective, I do not believe that the issues with our food system justify taking the life of an innocent animal. Mm-hmm. Right. So it's like, yeah, maybe the plas- maybe the the vegan product um is comes wrapped in plastic and was shipped from around the world, but like there's not an inherent problem. Like and I, I'm not a fan of plastic and single-use plastics, but like plastic is a problem because it doesn't decompose and it's, you know, building up in our world, but that's not inherently literally slitting an individual's throat and taking their life and causing violence. Right? Right? It's a sustainability issue. Um, a lot of meat comes in plastic eggs come in styrofoam cart, you know, so it's like, there's the food system issues, and then there's the ethics. And so from an ethics perspective, even if you have this small local family farm, where an animal is treated really well, and then I've, I've literally heard this, right, people will say, well, they just had one bad day, like they had a great life, and then you know, they were killed as quickly and and humanely as possible. Mm -hmm. Like, you're still 
taking the life of a being that feels pain, is aware, wants to live, has friends and family members and connections, like they have social networks. Mm -hmm. They so so even theoretically, right, people don't think about this. They're like, oh, well, I killed the cow as quickly as possible. They suffered as little as possible. What about their babies that are left behind? What about their their best friends in the field? Those are very real, scientifically proven connections Mm -hmm. and experiences that many animals have. And so, you know, at the end of the day, how can we justify taking the life of a being that wants to live if we don't have to? Mm -hmm. So, so even if it's done five minutes down the road, we are still uh, needlessly causing violence and suffering and death Mm -hmm. to a sentient being. Um, So, Yeah. So so that's like, you know, on different levels. And then going back to the whole foods, I do want to add in, I have friends that have actually investigated some of the whole foods supplier, like high animal welfare rated farms or like cage free, free range chicken farms. And every time my friends have gone in and investigated these farms, they have documented things that are pretty much absolutely no different than factory farms. So the vast majority of, you know, the supposedly better farms Mm -hmm. are just marketing. Um, And and there's, there isn't much of a difference. And so, um, and, and then, you know, but I do agree. There are some farms like what you mentioned before, like your friend who has these chickens or, you know, whatever, there are some places that really aren't just marketing and, and, you know, humane washing and green washing. But one of the problems with those from a sustainability perspective, first, I'll say, is any time, one of the ways that I like to analyze sort of the ethics and sustainability or, you know, morals of a certain choice, right? The choice to go and buy eggs from that farm or something is what would the world look like if everyone did what I did or if everyone made that same choice? Mm -hmm. So This is where, and you said this like very early on in the conversation that there's the argument that factory farming exists because it is the only way to like feed the world. I would say it is the only way to feed the world the animal products and level of animal products we are consuming. So grass-fed, free-range backyard farms actually use more land, more water, more resources, more time. And in sustainability and resource use terms, they are worse. Like Mm -hmm. when you cram a bunch of animals into a small area and, you know, fatten them up really quickly, that is more sustainable. That can feed more people, you know, cheap animal products. Right. So, so while, you know, maybe it's possible for you to go to a farm and buy these eggs, is that a way to feed the whole world eggs? What would happen if we took a backyard grass fed, you know, free range chicken farm and tried to feed the whole world's demand for eggs? It's mm-hmm. literally not possible. Same grass fed beef um, alone. If we were to try and convert all current um, beef production just in the United States to truly like grass fed pasture raised cows we would need more physical land area than is in the entire lower 48 states you know just dedicated to grazing cows so it's like it's it's, you know so it seems like a good idea but then you're kind of setting this example and standard that the whole world cannot mimic so if someone sees you eat eggs every time like you know let's say this is theoretical but let's say you did start eating eggs buying them from this farm you are setting the example. And if you don't mention every time you buy them, well, don't go and buy real eggs, you know, or these these eggs from a factory farm or whatever, then other people might be like, well, he's eating eggs. Maybe I'll do that now or it's okay. And right. they're still supporting, you know, this other system because they right. we cannot meet demand. Um, but sorry, one more thing I want to say here. Yeah, go ahead. Um, this, is, this is the big one. So, So I'm kind of, you know, answering this question on several levels. So the next one is in terms of eggs, I do think there's a lot of misinformation around eggs being, you know, harmless and not hurting animals. Mm -hmm. And so um, I'm going to back up a little bit and say that, you know, so I was raised vegan from birth and my mom went vegan 
in the early 1990s, just before she had me. Mm -hmm. And the reason that really, you know, turned her vegan was she worked for a pharmaceutical company and part of her job took her to tour animal testing labs, chicken hatcheries, and pig farms in the Midwest. So they were kind of her customers. So she didn't like work in them, but she'd have to go and talk to the people running these facilities, kind of tour them, analyze them so she could sell her products. So she saw firsthand inside the food system in the Mm -hmm. early 90s. And it was a chicken hatchery specifically that really was one of the most um, influential experiences she had that turned her vegan. Mm -hmm. And so a chicken hatchery is a basically factory farm for breeding chickens that then get sent to uh, either be raised for chicken or be raised for egg. Like it's where you just have this constant breeding and then the chickens get distributed out to other places for different Mm -hmm. purposes. Mm -hmm. Um, so uh, what a lot of people don't realize is that even, you know, the best of the best backyard free range, you know, even like my neighbors actually in my new house here have a chicken coop in their backyard, right? Even something like that. My question is always going to be, where did they get those chickens? Right. If you go to a feed store and you buy chickens, if you mail order chickens online, those are the two most common methods that nearly every backyard farmer, local, whoever, they're doing one of those two things. If you are doing that, you are buying chickens from a chicken hatchery, which is a factory farm for chickens. And Uh, For breeding chickens, basically. Mm -hmm. And so in chicken hatcheries, this is actually one of the most disturbing parts of the egg industry that people don't know about. Because the purpose is to breed chickens, um, uh, especially at an egg laying chicken hatchery, right? So where you're breeding chickens to go out and produce eggs. The only chickens that matter in that process are the females. But half of all chickens that hatch in a chicken hatchery are male. They are economically deemed useless in this industry and are literally all macerated, thrown into a giant blender and ground up alive on their first day of life. And and my mom, so one of the experiences that she had was she, she was in a chicken hatchery and they have these like giant metal rolling carts with like multiple layers and baskets Mm -hmm. and they coordinate it really well so that all the eggs on a single cart all hatch you know down to often like the same minute or you know hour or minute to be as efficient as possible and then the first thing they do these carts come into a room and my mom saw men standing around and when a new cart would roll in they'd quickly pick them up look at them to sex them and then just toss them you know like inanimate objects males here females here The females would go on to like be injected with a bunch of vaccines and stuff and get their beaks cut off and all these other things. The males ended up going in the trash. Mm -hmm. And, um, but so she, she was outside, side this room, this one day that she saw this and she could see these carts rolling in and men standing around, like, you know, tossing chickens and then in between waiting for a cart to roll and they'd just be standing there smoking. And she'd see, because sometimes there was a backup of carts, that these these little, you know, just hatched chicks, some of them would jump off of these carts and, like, fall to the floor. And at first, when she saw this, she was, like, behind a bit of a wall and was kind of seeing this through a window. So she couldn't see the floor and didn't know what was happening to the chicks that jumped off the cart. And eventually her tour went around and she ended up being this other room. So she'd seen from a distance, all these chicks hopping off the cart while men stood around like smoking cigars. She gets into the room. The floor of this room was covered in half dead squashed chicks that would jump off the cart and no one bothered to put them out of their misery or pick them back up and put them on the carts. So new carts would roll in and roll over them, just, you know, smashing them, half killing them or fully killing them. And, and this experience like really horrified her because she knew this was the backbone of the egg industry. Mm-hmm. So this is the backbone of the backyard, of the free range, of even these supposedly more humane farms. Right. If they are purchasing chickens from 
feed store from pretty much anywhere. If they're purchasing chickens, they came from hatcheries. So then you're still part of and supporting this system. Mm -hmm. Um, And then two, right? What happens to the chickens when they are no longer laying enough eggs to be profitable? This is the other thing people don't think about. And, And growing up here in Kansas, like I know a lot of people that have personally raised eggs, had backyard chickens. And I've, I've asked them before, like, oh, you know, how, what do you do when your chickens stop producing, you know, eggs? Like, do you still just pay for them, feed them, you know? And most people that have chickens for the purpose of getting eggs from them, right? Don't want to just take care of chickens who can live for, you know, five, 10 years or more, past egg production they don't want to keep paying for them and taking care of them if their purpose is to get eggs from them it's not economically viable and profitable Mm -hmm. because they're viewing these animals as objects and things to produce something for us so so i you know have asked people personally and some people when i was growing up i remember in particular some family friends of ours originally were like oh well don't worry when they stop producing you know we take care of them and they did that for a little while and then they had too many and it was too expensive to take care of all the not producing you know egg you know layers so then they were like well we're giving them away to good homes and I was like what are people doing with them and they're like well we we just don't ask you know eventually it's like it was this slow process of like yeah they're selling them for meat because that's just you know when when we look at animals as objects and commodities to produce something for us as items that we can get food from their interests in this economic system will never come first. The, Mm -hmm. the, the owner, us, the oppressor, the, the person who controls their life, our interests, be they profit money, you know, taste, whatever it is, will always come before the interests of you know, the animals. And so, so I think that's, you know, that's the problem with taking eggs, even from a backyard farm, not to mention the problem of like other people thinking, you know, you're then normalizing eating eggs from chickens for other people to see who may not have access to, or be able to even try and get them from a better farm. Right. Yeah, that's actually what Nick said too. Nick, because he called on my post and he was like, Yeah, well, all those chickens are coming from factory farm chicken layers or however you say it. And yep. and I was pretty much like like every single one really. Like, I don't know if I believe that, but um you make it do you make it sound definitely more convincing that um a lot of them are for sure from it's uh, I mean those kind of places. It's, it's pretty much most unless you're rescuing them, um or, you know, you could theoretically buy some from a no- another local farm, but like at some point they probably came from a chicken hatchery. Yeah. And at some point, one of the farms down the line is restocking their supply of chickens from right. a chicken hatchery. Yeah. <laughs> well, <laughs> that is it's hard. Yeah. It's it's but it's yeah. the reality, right? Like that right. that is the reality. And people don't think about the egg industry. Um you right. know, backyard eggs, like that's one of the most common myths and questions I get. Like, what if mm-hmm. I get some eggs from some backyard chickens? And I think it's because people don't think about the full system and they don't know about hatcheries in right. particular. Right. Well, that's very informative and very good to know. And um, <laughs> now I'm now I feel educated. <laughs> I, I feel like I just went to <laughs> class. I went to egg class. <laughs> um Uh, yeah yeah so cool thank you for sharing all that and um i love your passion too about it and you're very well spoken um thank you (laughs) yeah really really great job there god what time is it so i still have a a bunch of questions um okay (laughs) keep going keep going i got time yeah yeah yeah. um i'd probably have like i don't know 20 or so more minutes (laughs) um oh 20 okay i thought you were gonna say 20 more questions i was like oh was yeah alive. okay <laughs> yeah i'm good for another 20 minutes okay cool 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 um so uh because I, I i do think that a lot like you that was all very well said um i do think that 
ethics and morals for a lot of people still don't get questioned. And I, I know I may be repeating myself. Um, so uh, I guess how do we make that distinction between other human beings and like is is it like a goal to be like who's more ethical and who's more like who can live more morally in regards to the decisions that are being made out there you know because if we want to live as ethical as possible i think there's plenty of factors in this world aside from what you put into your mouth that can go into um into ethics you know like uh even while we were sitting here i was thinking of um people like in I, I if I'm not mistaken, I think there's like kids in the like there's child labor and Apple and whatnot who like mm -hmm. farm chocolate different... for sure. Yeah, and all, all this stuff, like I like I think we know like it's pretty obvious that people are that humans are being exploited, that children are being traf trafficked, 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 Traf yeah, trafficked, which is dis I mean, it's just like disgusting. Like that's like I can't believe people actually um are a part of stuff like that you know um so i like i i just not, not that there's like levels to to how ethical you are in your life or to how moral one lives but i do think that there are there, there's a lot that goes into it you know like even with people with christianity right like there's some people who are like so hardcore on god and and their beliefs in god and all this stuff yet like they could be a horrible human in their real life. So it's like, are you, you know, are you living? Like you're not living to how you're preaching to how you're believing. This, like what's like, there's seriously something mentally wrong with you and you need to, you know, like you got to work on yourself. That's, that's how it is. But, but like, it's like that everywhere, you know, no one's perfect. Um, we're, we're all human. We all make mistakes, but um, I think we can definitely in both agree that to all sides of this, um, that there's a lot that there are some flaws. Like I'm sure you've even met some people who are vegan who are probably rude. Normal people. It, yeah, yeah, right. But I'm sure you've also probably met some of like the nicest people you've ever met in your life. You know, so and it's like that for all, even like the people who are like in the carnivore movement and keto and stuff. Like those guys, like you, you have some real jerks. You have some real, some real a holes. But then you also do have some like really nice people. So, um. And I think like a lot of those people, I, I actually would be interested in hearing what, what their thoughts are on stuff like this. Um, like people who just go carnivore and eat, you know, like, do they even question what, what happens in this kind of stuff, you know, in these industries and whatnot. And that's the thing is like, I just don't think a lot of people, I don't want to say that they're not aware of it. Cause I feel like they are aware, but they're not questioning like their ethics or their morals. They're, they're doing it for their health. And, uh, mm -hmm. um, so it's like, I, once again, I don't think it's like a necessarily a game to like see who's more ethical, but like, where do your ethic, like, how do we judge on the ethics? How do we judge on the moral side of it too? And then also going along with this, cause I thought of another question on the way, like, what are your thoughts on people who, who actually do see, cause I feel like there's so many factors, but I do feel like there are people who do better on more of like an animal based diet. Like they do feel better, like whether they've like done veganism wrong or, you know, they were raw vegan and they were only eating grapes for 17 straight days. And then they, then they ate apples for 15 days and then they ate only bananas. And you know, like, like obviously we see people and they're like, Oh my gosh, yep. now I started eating animal products again and I feel amazing. Well, it's like, no shit. Like look what you were eating. Like clearly you're not hitting all of your, like you're not hitting all of your macronutrients you're eating in a completely unbalanced way. Like, yeah, no, no crap. If you start going eating different kind of animal products, you're going to feel good. Like, and a lot of people, they don't, I, I feel like they don't go towards like the plant-based um, fat and protein side of it first. Like they just go directly to the um, animal products. And then they, and then like, they, and then they want to like blame veganism and stuff when it's like, was it really veganism? But I, I do think that like we can look at certain compounds of food, um, whether it is like raw vegetables or whether it is nuts or or whatever it is, tofu, different kind of plant-based meats, and we can compare it to like the digestibility of of meat or 
the digestibility of eating eggs or um, butter, like butter. I mean, you just, you put butter in and it's just like, if I'm not mistaken, it's like automatically absorbed because like, if you melt it, it's kind of like water. You can just like drink it. I mean, who's drinking Sounds butter? Gross. I don't know. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I guess like with oil too, you can just drink oil and like that to me, just, it just seems like very easily absorbable. Um, so I guess, so it's kind of like a two in one question here where it's like, where do you stand on like the ethics and morals and comparing that to like other people? Cause maybe some people do uh, like they're, maybe they're like ethically okay. And they're more, they feel morally okay to eat how they eat. Um, and then where do you stand on what if people, what if someone has done all they could to be a vegan and it just like, hasn't worked out. And, uh, like even Matt Monarch, I actually, that's like the guy on my story, even him, he's like, mm -hmm. he even in, in that video, it's, it's a really interesting video. And he looked, oh my gosh, he looked horrible before. Like he, he was malnourished, completely malnourished, like mm -hmm. was not healthy as a raw vegan. Um, and he even asked himself, he's like, okay, like, would I be a raw vegan again? And he's like, oh, I'm a raw vegan at heart, but truthfully, I wouldn't do it. Like I wouldn't, I wouldn't be a, a raw vegan again. Um, and now I think he does do, I think he does like egg yolks and there's this guy that he follows. I think his name is Norman Walker, but I guess that Norman Walker guy lived, he was like 99. He did like a lot of juice. He was like 90. 9% vegan, but that guy ate like egg yolks and he ate, um, Swiss cheese supposedly. And, uh, for whatever reason, I'm not sure why Swiss cheese. I'm not sure if there's anything in Swiss cheese. It doesn't make any sense, but I guess I'd have to read the book, but that's just what this Matt Monarch guy, this Matt Monarch guy would say is that, um, uh, that he ate that. And, and that's what Matt's doing too. I'm not sure if he's eating Swiss cheese. I have no clue, but I know, I do know that he does eat, um, eggs or at least the egg yolk. So, uh, and for him, like he does see that more from a health perspective and he doesn't look at it from like an ethical side of it. He's like, okay, like I can actually use this and it's going to be good for my body, especially, um, from what I've been eating. And I'm actually going to obtain the nutrition from it and actually utilize the nutrition from it. And it's going to be helping me and I feel good doing it. So, um, I'm not sure if, do you understand my question with that? Yeah. Yeah. I think so. Because I, like I even people with, even people who like say, like even like that Sean Baker guy. Yeah, I'm sure you heard of Sean Baker. That guy is like, yep. I eat meat and it's just like automatically absorbed. And like, if you would ask, um, uh, Everyday Detox Mike Perrine, he'd be like, No, you're just constipated as shit, and like, <laughs> it's just getting backed up in your colon right. and stuff. So there's just like so many of these different ideas. Like, what's actually true? What's actually reality? And mm -hmm. And how do we go about making informative decisions for our health, for our ethics and for our morals, you know? So, yeah. Um, so, I'll, okay. I'll let you so, take it away. Yeah. Let me start with the, the kind of first part of the question. Yeah. Um, which real real I, quick, real yes. quick. Cause like, even still, like, even like my friends, like, I, I don't want to like compare myself to my best friends and be like, Oh my gosh, I'm ethically superior than you. Or I'm like, I'm more, I live more a better morally life than you however you say it because i don't eat because like i don't eat a certain way you know because mm -hmm. i eat i eat how i eat so, you know you right. know what i'm saying so i do yeah well, let me reframe it for you right so yeah. so we uh i think we probably both agree that we have a pretty corrupt world there's a lot of problems human exploitation in addition to animal exploitation i'm with you on that yeah. right? right and i do believe that we should generally be trying our best as people to educate ourselves and live ethically, right? Whether that is, you know, in addition to living vegan, trying to buy fair trade, you know, chocolate that doesn't support child slave labor, um, right. you know, supporting small local businesses instead of Amazon when possible and, you know, mm -hmm. stuff like that. But I do think there's a difference between that. And I don't think we can equate that to, you know, like that that's the same thing as, as veganism in terms of, you know, ethics right. and right. The way I look at it is, okay, so take animals out of it. Let's just talk about people. People mm -hmm. are exploited in our current system, child slave labor, people working in slaughterhouses, you know, people working at Amazon and shitty, you know, different yeah, I mean, things. you could, you could argue everyone's exploited because like, I, cause people we're have, all, 
Yeah, but, like we're all here to make a pay. Like we're all here to work. We're all here to make a living. You know, we're but none of that justify someone going out and shooting another human in the head. Yeah, because right. right, you know, so we see there's a clear difference, right? You can have systemic exploitation, which we absolutely should work to try and change and do our best to, you know, not support. Yeah. But none of that justifies going out and intentionally killing or oppressing or enslaving like you know our personal choice um which it does happen we i mean we've hear of all these people who go into churches and go into school like the school oh, shooting it it's, it's horrible but but it's not justified and none of us would sit here and say yeah. well yeah. oh you know you can't live perfectly are you really trying to do your best to be ethical like everybody makes mistakes like no one would say like we shouldn't be saying that and i think the average person isn't going to be like well, you know, there's child slave labor in the system, so it doesn't matter that someone killed a bunch of kids at a school. Like, that's absurd and sounds horrible. Um, right. But I think that is kind of a comparison when we're like, well, all these animals are being murdered. and But, you know, even if you're vegan, you should always be. It's like, yes, there's always more we can do. But yeah. just because we can't live, you know, perfect lives and just because it's not possible to avoid all exploitation and harm that doesn't justify going out and doing it mm -hmm. and and i would also you know push back on the idea of like you know you don't want to be ranking yourself about you know with your friends of judging who's more ethical yeah right but if, you, <laughs> if your friend went out and mm -hmm. shot someone would you be saying the same thing would you be, I'd like, be like whoa what? i'm like i am not your friend right. or... <laughs> we wouldn't sit here and be like, like dude oh, what the fuck are you doing I'm not yeah. more ethical, you know, that's, that's them. Like, no. And so that, yeah. I think we, uh, I think we are often saying that. And I hear that from a lot of people because we are so conditioned and desensitized to the plight of animals yeah. when it's the same thing. It's like judgment is not an inherently bad thing. Yeah. We, and I'm not saying like, go out and judge your friends and, and, and you know, per se, but at the same time, like, that's not a good defense. Like, yeah. and the way I distinguish it, I think there's a big difference between both shame and guilt and judging a person and judging their actions. So like, mm -hmm. I have been straight up with people. And to be honest, like most of my friends are vegan at this point because I do judge people's action to choose to continue eating animals if it's possible for them not to. Yeah. Um, right. If someone doesn't know any better, if they haven't been given the information, if they haven't seen slaughterhouse footage, I hold that in a slightly different light. But if someone, which when you're my friend, you're going to learn this information. If you look <laughs> at it and you're like, I don't care, you know, this isn't my morals or whatever. I'm not going to change. That is a bit of an issue for me at this point in my life, because it is a little bit comparable. It's like, well, you are fine like you know especially because most of the time it's for taste or convenience it's not for these you know extreme health situations which are a slightly different situation right most of the time yeah. people continue eating animals because it's their tradition it's convenient they like the taste they just you know don't want to give up what they're used to and yeah. those are not good justifications for killing innocent beings and mm -hmm. so yeah i'm and, and I do distinguish, right? Like, I don't think people are bad people for doing that, especially because there is so much propaganda and brainwashing. But I will be clear, I think your choice to continue doing that is wrong. Mm -hmm. And it is a better choice not to pay for innocent animals to be tortured and killed. Mm -hmm. and, and as like that, you know, if you, if you're fine, like with me thinking that and being friends with me, like, okay. But if you're going to feel judged or have an issue with that, because I voice what is my opinion and, and I think is the reality, then mm -hmm. yeah, we're probably not going to last as friends. And so <laughs> that's, that's just the reality. It's like, yeah. <laughs> I don't feel bad about like, yeah, same thing with drunk driving, right? Like, I remember I had a friend in college one time who was making a joke about how he drove home buzzed from a party at one point. And I was like, I don't think that's funny. Like, you could have hurt someone and, like, drunk driving is bad. I wasn't like, I'm not going to be your friend and you're a horrible person. I was like, that was a really poor choice and yeah. that's a bad decision. Like, don't yeah. do that. You know, but then no, we, come we to know animals. you did. You slapped him. You said you're an idiot. You slapped him. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but like, it just it shows our hypocrisy and how we value humans and yeah. and and 
basic fundamental rights, but not animals, because then it's like, oh, I don't want to judge someone. Oh, you know, I don't think it's any more moral for me. Like, yes, it is. It's more moral not to take the life of innocent beings if we don't have to. Yeah. Um, and I, I don't think we should have a problem saying and admitting that. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah. So on, on the ethics front, like, I think that that is a difference there. And similarly, um, oh well, yeah, so, so I'll, I'll start with that there and then shifting over to the, the other side of things mm -hmm. with these, you know, health issues and stuff. Right. Yeah. yeah. I think, um, that, I've heard a lot of these stories. I've seen a lot of ex-vegan stories and stuff like that, which is part of the reason I'm very passionate about this issue. Um, and I think a lot of it has to do with people, many people that get labeled vegan or call themselves vegan. Uh, and I've seen this a lot in the raw vegan community too. Kind of like you were saying with some of those guys, like I don't think they ever were in this for ethics or ever really understood the ethical imperative to not eat animals. It mm. was a health trend. It was a personal, you know, trying to achieve something or, or something like that. And that does make a huge difference because mm. I think they're like the pressure, the social pressure and norms and propaganda to convince people to eat animals in our society is so incredibly powerful. I think most people don't even, like they're so not aware of it. And if you're not aware of it, you can't like consciously counter it in your own head. So I have seen a lot of people like, oh, I was doing this or that and I felt really bad or I, you know, my health started to deteriorate or I had this issue. And right. sometimes, yes, I, I agree with you. It's because someone was just eating grapes or apples and it's like, okay, well, you don't have to go back to eating animal products. Like try some vegan junk food, try a varied plant-based diet, you know, right. like it's not a diet. So give up your, you know, solo, you know, mono fruit diet and try some beans or whatever. Um, and a lot of people don't do that. They don't have, you know, good information and resources or they they started something because it was a trend they saw or people they followed on social media, influencer culture, like whatever. Um, which, yeah, I, I think some of that is, is not helpful. Mm -hmm. and, and space nutrition information out you know they're powerful but we need to look at the evidence too um so yeah so some people are i think you know essentially not doing it right and causing health issues that mm -hmm. could be fixed by literally just switching up your diet while still not eating animals right but then there are people who are eating a very diet whenever they get some health issue and i think are so oblivious and unconscious of the forces and propaganda in society that tell us we need to eat animals, that that's where their brain goes to when they have a problem. Mm -hmm. And so, so my mom is a really good example of this. So when she, you know, was raising me vegan in the nineties, um, when she first went vegan, she'd never met another vegan in real life, let alone didn't know any other people like raising vegan kids. She maybe mm -hmm. met one when I was, um, you know, a few I don't remember exactly when she met someone else raising vegan kids, but it was a little while at first. Right. Um, and she had done the research. Like she had a, a background in microbiology. She went to the medical library. She was like literally reading studies and stuff and books and early nutrition information about the benefits of plant-based diets. So she believed that this was not just okay, but healthier and better for me and, and my sister and I. Like she thought she was really doing the right thing. And yet um, when I was like a year old, I think she and my dad were carrying me by my arms, you know, like by my hands and like swinging me, like walking upstairs or something. And all of a sudden I like screamed out in pain. She heard this noise and like I clutched my arm as like a one-year-old. And sh she told me, right? Like even with all of her knowledge and all of her belief that this was adequate, uh, if not healthier for us, her immediate thought was, oh my God, I just broke her shoulder, her arm, because she has weak bones because we're not giving her cow's milk. 
you know, that's where her brain went. And she was aware of it and was like, no, that's not true. But like, that was the fear yeah. in her head. And she, she took me to the chiropractor who was like, oh, this is called nursemaid's elbow. Like, you're really not supposed to swing young kids by their arms like this because their, their elbow can like pop out, pop out of joint really easily. And it's a common thing. It has oh, nothing geez. to do with their bones. You know, so he like wiggled my arm, popped it back into place and was like, all good. You know, I was like, this has nothing to do with weak bones. This is just like, don't hang your kids, you know, don't swing them by their hands. <laughs> right, right. So, but th- I tell that story, right? As an example of like, my mom was dedicated beyond belief to the ethics and justice and morals of doing this. So, you know, she was absolutely going to do everything she could to make us, you know, be healthy and make sure we were vegan and thriving. And her head still was like, oh, this is my fault. It's because I'm not giving them cow's milk. So if that's what she could think, think about all the people that maybe are mildly into the ethics. They aren't very dedicated. They don't know any other vegans. They don't have any support around them. It is so easy in our society with all of the propaganda and advertising from these companies to go, oh my God, I got sick. It's because I'm not eating animal protein. Oh my God, I can't build muscle. It's whatever it is. So I think it's less often about actual legitimate physical health issues and more psychological pressure in society Mm -hmm. that have like trained us to think a certain way that that's, you know, where our brains go. Um, And so, so another example, um, a family friend of ours, she is like a, a long time, you know, 20 or 30 year vegan. And some years back, she started to have like chronic, like debilitating physical issues. Like something was going on. It seemed like, like she literally kind of fit the stories I've heard of, of people that started deteriorating. Like we're having this and that and like chain, couldn't figure out anything. She had absolutely no idea what was going on. She was trying everything holistic, natural remedies, changing her diet, eating raw, eating more, you know, like whatever. And it kept going on, right? And this is a similar situation where I think someone much less dedicated to the ethics and not harming animals would have sat here and been like, I need to try adding animal protein. Maybe that's what's going on. There's all these anecdotes. There's all these stories out there, right? She can, she says, no, no, I'm not going to do that. Continues doing research stumbles across some information about how some people's mercury fillings in their teeth can leach after time and cause mercury poisoning. And that it fits her whole host of symptoms of like literally all these issues going on. She goes to a specialist dentist, has her mercury fillings removed, problems stop and she's fine, right? So it's like, but she was struggling for a long time and was really, really dedicated to figuring out the root cause and was not going to go off and try and eat animal protein to fix this. Mm -hmm. And again, I think that's like, if you are like, well, I think this is healthier or I'm kind of doing this to be more sustainable and you don't have that grounding of like, I'm not going to eat animals. I'm not going to hurt, you know, animals. Like animals are not food. Mm -hmm you're going to be so much more easily swayed, you know, to look to that option, right? Think about cats and dogs. When we have a health issue, none of us here in America are like, maybe it's because I'm not eating dog milk, or maybe, maybe my health problem would be fixed if I ate dog protein, right? (laughs) Like, cause we don't look at dogs and cats as food here. So why do we think that other animals have some magical, you know, nutrients or things that can like fix us and heal our problems. Mm-hmm. Um, so I don't know. Did I answer? Did I answer yeah. all parts of the question? If not, yes. keep asking. Yes. No. No. You definitely. You definitely did. You definitely did. So, um, I think that's all I have for you. I I, I still have more questions, but I think our time is slowly yeah. coming to an end here. Um, uh, do you have any final thoughts that you want to give out or talk about? Um, I guess the last, I'll, I'll say one last thing, which yeah. is, um, the question that I most like to ask people to think about that to me, mm-hmm. this is the root of what we're talking about and what I educate people about. Do you agree that it's wrong to hurt animals 
unnecessarily. And obviously different people have different ideas of what necessary is, but by your definition of necessary, you know, do you think it's wrong to hurt animals for pleasure, for fun, for entertainment? And yeah. not everyone does agree. There are people, right? Like if you participate in horse racing or dog racing, like you think it's okay to hurt animals for fun. Um, but most Americans that I talk to agree with that question. They're, they would say they are against animal abuse. They would, you know, right? Like, I think you say like, oh, if someone was beating a dog on the street in front of you, do you think that's wrong? And would, you know, you try and stop that dog Yeah. or stop that man from beating that dog, you know, cause he's just getting enjoyment out of it. Like, yes, most of us would. And that's what we're talking about here. Like, mm -hmm. even if there is some the polar ice caps or whatever, and you don't have access to plant foods, right? Like that is not most people. So mm -hmm. if you personally are against animal abuse and you think it's wrong to hurt animals unnecessarily, how can you justify participating in it, supporting it and paying for it if you don't have to? Mm -hmm. And I think that is the question everyone should be asking themselves. That's the question we should be asking each other. And that gets around a lot of these gray areas and dilemmas, right? Like if you are in that minority of people that truly theoretically, you know, it's really difficult, like that's not who I'm talking to. And those situations potentially existing do not justify everyone else continuing to support this and go right. along with this system. Right. Cool. Really good. So really yeah. great there. <laughs> final thoughts. Yeah. No, no, great final thoughts. <clears throat> I actually have one more question that came up. Okay. Um, if you can maybe have a short answer. Uh because okay. I do have to leave soon, but uh, and I'm sure you have stuff to do as well. Um so what would you say is like the end goal of veganism? And I I, I know that you mentioned you, you talked a lot about stuff um in regards to veganism and even like um the impacts and how we can go towards veganic farming and all this stuff. Right. So like, do you, do you foresee like there to be like no farms? Do you foresee there to be no cows on this earth? Like, do you think there shouldn't be chickens on this earth? Like, do you think there shouldn't be pigs on this earth? Like, do you think that there shouldn't be people who have farms who like, this is their livelihood. This is how they work. This is how they make a living. And like, aside from the factory farm stuff, like this is just like mm -hmm. people in their personal lives who like, right. they grew up on a farm. They were born into that. That's what they do. That's how it is. That that's their life. Like, do you think that, uh, there shouldn't be stuff like that, that there shouldn't be animals at all? Or if so, how do we use these animals? Because I think a lot of people would make the argument of like, okay, if they're a cow into nature, they're gonna, they're, they're screwed. You know, if they're a pig into nature, I know there's like wild hogs and stuff who have, you know, husks or whatever uh -huh. and yeah. uh, they can protect themselves. But like, if you throw like a, a regular pig or um, if you throw a chicken into nature, I mean, they're going to just, they're just going to die regardless. So like, do you believe these animals should be on earth? And if so, what is their purpose that they're serving on earth for us? Does that make sense? Like, does that make yeah, yeah, sense? Yeah, it does. And I think you just gave away my answer uh -huh. um, with the very last sentence you said uh -huh. which is like how are they serving us for what is their purpose on earth set right? right so by animals as objects that we need to be getting something from mm -hmm. whereas i would argue they are individuals that deserve to live in their own right so would we say the same thing about people right mm -hmm. like oh what if what if we uh, you know had all these excess children if they weren't working in you know child slave labor like what's their purpose how would they you know like their purpose would be to live their own life free from you know suffering and exploitation mm -hmm. um so yeah but i mean I do not believe, I believe we should not be bringing animals into existence for us to use and exploit. And that is what the farming industry is doing. So 
to me, it's an irrelevant question of like, you know, what do we do in some future time with the few cows or, you know, right? Like, like yeah. we are actively bringing more animals into the world every single day right. so that we can profit off of them, slaughter them and consume their bodies. Right. So, so it's like, yeah, that's wrong. We should not breed beings that can feel pain and suffer into existence so we can use them. Mm -hmm. um, so, so a small farmer's livelihood or profit does not justify oppressing and killing and slitting the throat of a cow who wants to live. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and and if and when we reach the world where there's, you know, we're not killing them for food anymore, then we can figure out what to do with the few animals who do remain. But right. like theoretically if people stop eating animal products or, you know, the system starts to shift, fewer animals will be bred into existence mm -hmm. for us to use. So it'll be this like slow, you know, phase out. And then there are sanctuaries that exist with the sole purpose of giving a home to, you know, animals, domesticated animals for the purpose, not of getting something from them or us using them, but for the sole purpose of giving them life and sanctuary Mm -hmm. and taking care of them with them in mind. So I would say that whatever domesticated animals are left in some future vegan world, they would go to sanctuaries to be taken care of and, mm -hmm. and live out their lives. Cool. Very good thoughts yeah. there. Very good <laughs> thoughts. Appreciate that. Um, awesome. Well, that's all I have. Uh, Serena, really amazing, insightful, informative, factual interview. Uh, you look beautiful. Your hair looks great. Uh, you're an amazing you. woman. Uh, I Once again, I respect your work that you do. I appreciate that your work that you do. Um, keep up the great work and keep you know spreading that message and keep doing what you're doing. So, uh, well, thank I just, you. I, I'm i so glad you let me come on here and, yeah, of course. and uh, share my perspective <laughs> and, and uh, yeah, responded to my thoughts. So For thank sure. you. For sure. Of course. Um, yeah, there were like, uh, there was three little snippets where you cut out a tad bit of, I, I think, um, I think every, everything should be pretty clear regardless. So, uh, actually two of them kind of sort of came at the end here. So guys, my apology for that. Uh, the Wi-Fi is not I, the best on this side, but, um, we do what we can, right. Um, I still think the message was, um, heard and there was once again, only a tad bit wrong there, but anyways, uh, once again, thank you so much. And, um, that's all I have for you guys today. So, uh, stay up, be great. Always give it a hunt baby. Thanks, Serena. All right. Thank you.